Welcome to Startup Hacks, a We Global podcast. We explore the stories and secret strategies that women entrepreneurs use to save time and money when bootstrapping and building their businesses. I'm your host, Fernanda Carapina, and today I'm excited to welcome Rhonda Fraley. Welcome, Rhonda. Thank you so much for having me. It is our pleasure. I'm delighted to have you on the show today. I'd like to begin by having you share a little bit about your background, where you're from, and how you got started in the entrepreneurial life. Yeah, absolutely. So I started my career um, really working as a cocktail server, waiter in the restaurant industry. And I, after graduating with my undergrad degree in Texas, I ended up moving to Las Vegas, Nevada, where I got my first management job, and it was still in the food and beverage space. I got a lot of experience behind the scenes learning about wine, um, learning about wine lists, and um, about food and beverage in general. But then I took sort of an alternative career path into the human resources space, where I learned a lot about employees, employee engagement, human interaction, um, facilitation, adult education. And with both of my pieces of experience, I think it sort of gave me this light bulb moment, which brought me into what I do now into the entrepreneurial space. And so I thought to myself, you know, I really would love to get back into wine. That's really where my passion is. But how can I use the skills that I've learned in food and beverage and human resources to add value to people in a new way? And I feel like I was uniquely positioned to break down wine and make it approachable for the casual wine drinker. Wow. Well, um, I have to say it's an incredible time for you to be in the wine business because I think the entire world is drinking so much wine on a daily basis to, um, you know, pass the time and to also um, help us deal with very stressful life right now. And I, I have here um, uh, some interesting facts that I wanted to share, which is you're the founder and sommelier at the Wine Party Company, which you founded, where you're making organic boutique wines accessible um, to consumers and helping them learn about wine in a very kind of approachable way which I think is really great because I personally love to drink wine, but I, I don't really know a lot about how wine is made and how to pair wine. And, and I think it's wonderful to provide organic wine, especially since if you drink it, you don't want all those pesticides. You never really think about wine that way. But I would imagine that was probably one of the reasons you wanted to start the company. Absolutely. I really had this desire to start the company when I was ready to host a wine tasting. I had just gotten a house and I wanted a reason to celebrate and bring people over. So I went down this path of trying to host a wine tasting and I did know a lot about wine. Um, and I thought, well, this will be easy. It turned out after looking for some guidance online and trying to figure it out, it ended up being really overwhelming. And I thought, you know, for someone like me who does know a lot about wine, this is probably a problem for a lot of people out there who also want to get into wine and maybe host an experience at their own home. So that really was the moment or in the initial problem that I was trying to solve. But as I was getting to know my customers, socializing the company and the idea and the problem I was trying to solve, I realized that there was a bigger problem for people and they wanted to learn about wine and they want to kind of have some tips and tricks to feel confident when they're ordering at the wine bar and maybe a couple hacks to impress their friends along the way. But they didn't feel like they had access and the knowledge they needed to be um, a smart consumer making health conscious choices. So I had so many people saying, you know, do you stock organic wines? What are natural wines? Can I get my hands on those? You know, can you help me make that um, transition from conventional to organic. And so now with my wine club, I launched an organic only wine club and some tasting packs that are um, single shipments. Interesting. And is it is it hard to find vineyards that are growing organic grapes? Yeah. So only 10% of the um, grapes being grown or wines being produced in the world are organic. Really? And is that, um, I mean, is that in the United States, in Europe, abroad? I mean, where do you find those those vineyards? 
Yeah, it's really worldwide. The The biggest producers of organic wines really come from Europe. You know, you've got Spain, France, and um, some of Italy doing some good work in organics. But California, um, in the United States wine production, they're going very organic, which is great. So are most of the California wines that, um, like Chardonnays, et cetera, are there often options? Um, like, would you find them at the market, et cetera? Or, or do, would we need to go through kind of a boutique store or, of course, your platform? Yeah, absolutely my platform. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, you can find organic wines mostly in kind of niche wine shops. So a shop that sells organic natural wines, for example, um, Whole Foods is a place where you can go. Most people have access to a Whole Foods um, and they do sell um, some good, or, good organic wines. But when you're at the grocery store or even when you're at the shop, it is hard to tell if a wine is organic or not because producers aren't always putting that information on the label. So it can be hard to tease that out. Interesting. And I was kind of curious to learn about these experience guides that you've created. Could you talk a little bit about that? Of course. When you get a shipment of wine... Um, it can feel overwhelming. You know, why did they choose these wines for me? What it, what should I expect? How should I serve them? What am I trying to taste for? Um, and for people who are not very experienced at tasting wines, um, and even for people who are experienced at tasting wines, it's nice to know the background of the winemaker and how the wine is made and some information like that. So with every shipment that I send out, I include an experience guide. And it's kind of like a lifestyle magazine that gives people a deeper and closer look at what's behind every label, what's inside every bottle. So I'll share the stories of the winemakers, what their belief systems are, how they grew the grapes and how they made the wine, what their philosophies are. Um, But I'll also show you, you know, what temperature do you serve it at? What foods go well with it? Um, and kind of sharing a little bit more information that turns a bottle of wine into a broader experience. Right. I love that. I'm originally from Portugal myself and a huge wine drinker, and I'm going to have to sign up at your platform (laughs) because I would love that. So let's switch gears for a moment. Um, Obviously, you've created something that is very well-timed as a new company because wine sales are really taking off. But I'm sure that, you know, as a, as a founder bootstrapping in those early days and, and perhaps still even now, um, there were strategies that you used in order to really stretch the dollar and to maximize your time, right? Because we all start off as, as solopreneurs and you're doing literally everything. Um, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about some of the strategies and techniques or maybe resources, whether it was software or platforms, um, or even just your own kind of secret sauce that you would use to help you manage your time or take care of yourself or even to maintain a competitive edge as you entered the marketplace um, as you um, kind of ventured into this entrepreneurial world, if you don't mind sharing some of those. Yeah, I have learned a lot along the way, So some the hard way and some uh, great advice that I've received from people who have gone before me. So what has really worked for me as kind of a time saver, but also um, a way to stretch the dollar has been doing a lot of things myself. And now you might be wondering, well, then how in the heck does that, uh, you know, really help her be more efficient with her time? It really... Um, I'll share the example and you'll see for yourself kind of how that worked out for me. Um, A lot of people when they're starting out, um, and myself included, you wonder, okay, well, how do I make a website? Um, A lot of times you think that you need to work with someone in tech or you need to work with a designer and it needs to be this big project. Um, I was speaking with someone the other day. She said she got a quote for $15,000 to make her website. And it was just a very simple, um, you know, a simple page for her to sell just a handful of products. It wasn't anything huge. Um, So I had explained to her what I did and the advice that I got, which was make your own website on a platform like a Squarespace or a a spot of, um, not Spotify, Shopify. Mm -hmm. Uh, So squarespace.com is the web platform that I use. And the benefit is, is you can make it your own. It's really easy to use. You can get a web page up and running in just a day. 
and it costs about $500 a year. And the best part is, is you can tweak it as much as you like. And so as you're just starting out, you're refining your messaging, you're refining your brand positioning, you're, you're wanting to change your copy. If you have to send that up to your tech team, there's going to be a bill associated, there's going to be time associated. So you can be a lot more nimble when you kind of bring a few things in house in a way that is really easy for you to use as someone who, if you're like me, isn't a, you know, a crazy technical person. Um, right. Yeah. So, so that's one of my, that's one of the big tips I give people when they're first starting out. Yeah. A hundred percent. I, I myself used, uh, have used Wix, but it, it is the same idea. I mean, these days there's really a lot that you can do. Even if you were to hire someone to consult and work with you while you build it so that if you, you know, have issues, uh, you have someone to lean on, but it is still, a lot less expensive than um, handing it over to someone else, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, there's a there's an argument if you've got a really um, a com- complex solution that you're trying to build or you're trying to create something that um, really does require tech expertise, then you know you do need to go for you know the more tech option. But when you're when you're starting out and you're keeping it small and you just want a place to go to share a few things about your company. It, it's a lot easier to do it in-house. Absolutely. So talk to me a little bit about time management, because since you have um, really done it all, how did you do it all and, you know, not work, you know, 20 hours a day? Easier said than done. But <laughs> I, um, I had kind of learned about the uh, an interval method called the Pomodoro method, and that is what I swear by for me personally, every single day. So I'll set a timer and I do one task for the duration of the timer. So I'll do it, you know, I'll, I'll focus on a task anywhere from 25 to 45 minutes. And then once that timer goes off, I can switch gears or I can keep working. But by working in intervals, focused intervals, you're able to have dedicated time and you're, you're, you've made it to the flow zone where you're probably feeling more creative, being more productive because you're working on one project rather than being scattered and thinking of all of the millions of things that you need to do um, and trying to do them all at once. It keeps you kind of focused so that you can get better outcomes on yeah. one thing and then switch gears to the next. Yeah, I love that idea. I'm going to have to try that myself. And I would think it's probably helpful to silence your notifications and to not look at your email. Yeah, when I was working in my human resources capacity, actually, I would only I made it to a place where I would check my emails at defined periods throughout the day. I would check it, you know, once in the morning after I had um, completed a few of my urgent tasks. And then I would check it in the afternoon because otherwise all you're doing all day is responding to emails. Oh my gosh. I so, so agree with you. It's just like a bottomless pit. Truly. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about com- maintaining a competitive edge because I recall you sharing with me earlier, um, how you were able to really spend time with your customers and that how that really helped you. Absolutely. And that is one of the things that I feel so lucky to have is customers who are gracious enough to share feedback with me. Um, And it has given me a competitive edge. And it actually, you know, we even talked about it a little bit earlier. It charted the course for my my company and the direction that I'm going and really the problem that I'm trying to solve. Because if you are talking to your customers and keeping your finger on the pulse of what they need, then you can create solutions for them. And so, you know, I'll, I'll touch base with my customers. I'll send them a, a DM on Instagram or shoot them a text if, if that's the kind of relationship that we have. Even some of my customers I'll have a glass of wine with. And I ask them, you know, how did you like this wine? How did you like that wine? Um, and then some customers have given me feedback on the price points, the styles of wine that I carry. You know, they asked me if I could do a red only and a white only instead of a mix pack. And, or can I create a gift 
um, solution. So it's not a subscription, it's a, just a single shipment. And all of those pieces of feedback are things that I've implemented and I implemented it for people who wanted it. So mm-hmm. I'm being responsive. And I feel like that's one of the best parts about being a small company, because when you are a big company and you have a lot more layers of bureaucracy to make it through, you can't be as nimble. But when you're small, you can make a change like that. You can drop that price. You can add that product. Um, and you and that can be a huge competitive advantage over some of your more established competitors in the beginning. I completely agree. I think customer service is everything. And product market fit is really key to success, especially for um, early stage companies. If you if you really master that, it gives you a huge competitive edge, edge because like you said, you know, it takes you probably 30 minutes to pivot. It would take another company probably three months. So it is a big plus. Exactly. Great. Well, let me ask you um, a couple uh, a couple other questions. And so this is a, a, a new area. I'm going to ask you to imagine you could wave a magic wand. And if you could, what one thing that drives you crazy do you wish that someone would find a solution for that if they did would really help your productivity and or your sanity? What a good question. <laughs> So the big thing that's keeping me up at night is customer acquisition. Of course, thinking about how do I get traction? How do I grow? So if someone could wave a magic wand and make advertising less expensive, I would jump on board and give them free wine. Mm, okay. I think you're going to get some calls. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I think you're definitely going to get some. So to talk a little bit more about that, because I would imagine that our listeners, I mean, listen, that's something that we all need, right? Customer acquisition. Without it, you don't have a business. So, so can you dig a little deeper on that? Sure. So I have been thinking about, okay, we're coming into um, a period where I'm going to be trying to get a lot of sales, right? And so I've looked at and research all of the different avenues that I could go down to acquire customers. And you have to be mindful of that cost of acquisition because you can spend a lot of money doing a lot of things. Um, but when you're just starting out and especially bootstrapping like I am, you have to be methodical and you have to make sure that you're going to get a return on your investment um, and that you're going to get the results that you want to achieve. So brand awareness is one thing, but conversions is a totally different thing thing and conversions and customer acquisitions, what I'm focused on. So I've looked at, you know, what are some free solutions? Mm -hmm. So I've been doing, I've been DMing potential customers. So people who fit my ideal target customer, um, kind of fit, I've been sending people DMs and saying, Hey, do you want to talk? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And it's actually been working really well for me. People are interested in hearing what you've got to say. Um, They're interested in helping to support small businesses. And so I've had some pretty good conversations so far. And I'm thinking that's a good way to, uh, you know, get conversions for free, especially being online. It's almost like you open your store for the day and you're talking to customers. So it feels a little bit more real too. But I've also looked at how do I create great content organically on social media so that when someone shows up, they immediately understand what I'm about and they can join my community where I can talk to them. So that's getting their email. That's, you know, getting them, uh, you know, getting a follow on Instagram or Facebook. So these are some of the things that you can do for free. And I've been looking at what are some things that are paid and can I work that into the budget? So I've been looking at you know, advertising opportunities. I've been looking at influencer opportunities and, you know, just kind of what, what are all of my options out there? And I found that the, the advertising just is really expensive to get ad placements, to get features, to get people to post about you. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it really adds up. So it, for me, my research, it's kind of ranged anywhere from about 5,000 to even up to 60 or 75,000. And so as someone who's bootstrapping, probably not a, not a wise investment when you aren't completely sure what your return will be, because they're promising you impressions and they're promising you clicks, but that doesn't promise you conversions. So your money might not be coming back to you. It might be a great brand awareness play, but it might not be a great return on investment. 
Right, right. You know, um, it's interesting that you say that because actually one of the first companies that I founded um, assesses uh, fraud in social media, especially influencer fraud, and looks at fake impressions, fake clicks, fake followers, all of that. Yeah. Because, you know, you end up spending a lot of money, you're absolutely right, in order to reach your audience. And then um, you don't always know whether you're going to get those conversions. And sometimes you don't know if people have actually been honestly um, acquiring those followers as well. Um, so that's very interesting. And I, I agree with you that that is a big issue that we all have to, we all have to cross that, that, that river in our path. Yeah. And one, I think one great um, way to address that, if you're lucky enough to get it, is great free press. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that I didn't mention. I had been um, looking at who's been writing about wine, what angles can I pitch them, and sending just absolutely tons of emails. And so, you know, I'm so fortunate to have some people responding to me and actually some influencers have responded and they're willing to post about you just for wine because mm. they're interested in what you're doing and they want to support small business. And so I'm getting some great um, connections through press and through influencers, um, but you have to knock on a lot of doors. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's a ton of work. So let me ask you um, a, uh, an advice question. If there was an entrepreneur out there who's listening today, uh, and hopefully there's many, um, but if there was one who had a burning question and was just starting out, what one piece of advice would you give him or her that you wish somebody had told you when you were starting out? Oh, what a good question. The one piece of advice. I mean, I feel like people have given me so much good advice. I think that one thing that I heard time and time again, and, and maybe I didn't take it to heart so much, it was it was really going back to what I'd been touching on it, and it's talking to your customers. Mm. If there's one thing that you do before you start your company, talk to potential customers. Once you start keep talking, keep asking. And it can be really challenging too, because they might tell you that they don't like what, they don't like the path that you're going down. And they might tell you that it's too expensive or they might, you know, they might share really good insights that like for me, change your course of business and turn your idea into something that's even bigger than it ever was before. But, you know, take that feedback, really, you know, just keep a log of it write it down, hold on to that. And some things, be willing to be flexible, be willing to listen, be willing to change. And sometimes, you know, you will get advice that you don't want to implement. I've, I've had some people, you know, tell me that, you know, I should do a two pack of wines or something like that. And that's just not the right fit because it ends up, long story short, it's just not a good fit for me. Um, and so, Sometimes you get advice and it doesn't work. Sometimes you get advice and it's the thing that you needed to hear. You know, I, I share one example um, about how I didn't want to do a reds only pack because personally for me, I believe that if I'm curating the wines for you, I want you to enjoy the wines that I chose because I'm thinking about you and I'm thinking about what you're doing and I'm sharing information. And so these are wines that you can truly enjoy right now. And you should be expanding your palate because it's part of the experience of wine. But a friend said, well, what if someone wanted to pay you for a reds only pack? You wouldn't give it to them. And so I was like, well, of course I would. <laughs> so then I added the Reds Only Pack on my website. <laughs> and, you know, it's one of those things where if you listen to customers and you listen to feedback and, you know, you, you're you bold enough to implement it and ask those questions and, you know, because feedback hurts sometimes. Um, but if you're bold enough to do it, it can really pay off. Yeah, I think that's actually a great, great, great story and, and good advice because it's true. You know, you start a company, you have a vision for what that company will look like and what your product will look like. And then you um, you get out there and you realize that some of your assumptions were all wrong. You've made it way too complicated. Um, you're kind of approaching it from a good for you perspective as opposed to mm -hmm. what does the customer want. 
and um, and yeah, and and I think that is the beauty of being able to interface with your customers um, often and get that input input and make those changes. Um, well, lastly, I wanted to um, obviously say that um, I think the ability to have uh, wine and a product delivered to your home is, you know, so great, especially during this time of the pandemic, and especially with the holidays around the corner. So as we wrap up, um, are there any special holiday offerings that you may want to mention to our listeners? Absolutely. I am offering a um, Try It for $99 subscription. So normally our subscriptions run $125 a a month for four bottles of organic wines curated by yours truly. And, um, but we are for the holidays offering you guys to try it for just $99. And how many bottles did you say you get for that? Four. Four bottles. Great. Okay. All right, listeners, there you go. Here's your shot to try it. (laughs) Well, uh, Rhonda, I want to thank you for being on Startup Hacks today. Your insights are so helpful. And if our listeners would like to reach out to you or learn more about your company or order wine, uh, where should they go? Please reach out if you guys are interested in learning more from me or you know, getting recommendations on wine, too. I'm always good for that. Um, so please find me at The Wine Party Co. on Instagram. So it's at The Wine Party Co., And also check out my website at www.thewinepartyco.com. Got it. Okay. We need to remember that. The the winepartyco.com. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you again. And tune in next week for more Startup Hacks. We have another great show you won't want to miss on the secret female founder strategies that can save you time and money when building your business. This podcast is brought to you by Women Entrepreneurs Global, the first startup studio and digital do-it-yourself startup platform for women. For more information on our guests, this podcast, and many other female founder programs, please visit womenentrepreneurs.global. I'm your host, Fernanda Carapina. We'll see you next week.